White Magic 7 for Blood and Honor is an epic role-playing game featuring an immersive story and challenging gameplay in a classic fantasy setting, with some hidden sci-fi elements to be discovered. In this video I'd like to demonstrate how one can get very powerful very early in the game by using a few simple game mechanics. As the introductory cutscene shows, there is a dragon living on Emerald Island where the game begins with a scavenger hunt. Killing this dragon is not trivial, because at the beginning of the game the party is too weak to tackle such a mighty foe in a head-on fight. But there is a way to kill him and get his treasures. So let's get started. The party used in this video is very melee heavy, because a party like this benefits more from high level equipment than magic based groups do, and we will accumulate some very powerful equipment early on. But you can start the game like this with any combination of characters you choose. Something to keep in mind about this particular setup, since there is no sorcerer, the mastery of elemental magic, which gives access to some of the best spells in the game, can only be achieved by the Archer, and is therefore delayed until after the second promotion quest that is not available right away. The first thing we will do is run around the island and collect a few things, most importantly the contents of both chests that are easily available. The items itself are not important, this is only done to get some gold for the initial setup. Only the crossbows and bows are equipped by the characters that can do so. Everything else is immediately sold at the various stores in the village. It is very important to save the game before entering the Emerald Enchantment's magic store. Can I help you with anything? When entering the store for the first time, the game will decide what items it has for sale, and we want a very specific one a recharge item scroll. So we buy the scroll, sell everything else and start looking for two NPCs we need. A scholar and a cartographer. Specific NPCs can be found simply by reloading the game until they appear. A scholar provides unlimited item identification as well as additional experience, while the cartographer casts Wizard Eye at expert level meaning that we can see some more things, especially enemies and the projectiles they fire at the party, on the minimap in the top right corner. Learning more basic weapon and armor skills for the rest of the goal is optional at this point, but somewhat useful, mainly because we will get some problems with inventory space very soon, and this way we can immediately equip a few items we want to keep. Next, we will attract the attention of some dragonflies in the northwestern area of the island and lure them into the village. This is a rather cruel thing to do from a role-playing perspective, but in this video the point is to abuse game mechanics, so I really don't care. The main goal is to get Mr. Melvick killed, because he is carrying a magic wand that we want. We could also just accept his proposal, but that will lead to a somewhat annoying quest later on. Alternatively, one can just kill Mr. Melvick, but that decreases the party's reputation and turns the other peasants hostile. Once he is dead, we clear up any remaining dragonflies and loot all the corpses. Using the turn-based game mode is beneficial for ranged combat, because the monsters cannot move during the player's turn and therefore are incapable of evading any projectiles. By saving the game before looting Mr. Malvick, we can make sure that the wand has the maximum number of 31 charges. Ah, so powerful. The Goblin Knight is certainly right. The wand is very powerful at this point in the game and will be our main damage source when facing the dragon. And that's exactly what we're going to do next after getting a few buffs from the pillars. The cave itself contains a red dragon along with a few rats. The dragon will focus on killing the rats before paying attention to the party. One can use turn-based combat mode to shoot a maximum number of fireballs at the dragon before that happens by sequentially equipping the wand to the next party member that can act. 
But this will not be sufficient for an easy kill. Therefore we just keep firing until the dragon is done with all the rats. Occasionally the party will also land a hit with their bows, so technically the entire fight could be done without the wand of firewalls. However, this takes a very long time, so I strongly recommend getting the wand and the recharge item scroll to speed up this process significantly. Once the rats are dead and the dragon starts attacking the party, it is time to change back into real-time mode. Due to the buffs, the characters might survive one of its attacks, but simply tanking the damage is out of the question. The red dragon will obliterate the party. So the strategy for the remainder of the fight is to run around in circles, avoiding the dragon's attacks and shooting at him afterwards. At this point, the wizard's eye spell from the cartographer comes into play. With this spell, we can see the projectiles the dragon shoots on the minimap as small red dots. Whenever we see one of those projectiles, we keep running for a bit to dodge it, and afterwards it's safe to turn around and shoot back. Carefully counting the number of charges left on the wand will tell us when to use the recharge item scroll on it to get more. This will be necessary due to the fact that the red dragon has about 1300 hit points and even 31 wand uses are usually not enough to take him down. It's noteworthy that this dragon is a special version that slightly differs from other red dragons in the game. This is fairly obvious due to the fact that normal red dragons are immune to fire and this one is not. So once there is only single charge left on the wand, we use the recharge item scroll and in this case get back up to 23 charges, which will be more than enough. After running around a bit more, the dragon suddenly changes its behavior, which can be somewhat dangerous as it temporarily disrupts the run-turn-fire rhythm. This happens when the dragon's hit points are low enough for his AI script to enter the fear state, making him flee from the party. Only a few more shots and the Emerald Island dragon is nothing more than a big corpse. And a very valuable corpse that is, due to the looting mechanics in this game. As with Mr. Malvik, the exact loot is determined at the moment the corpse is picked up. It is possible to get very strong items such as artifacts and relics from this dragon. But even better, it is also possible that the corpse will not disappear and can be looted again. By saving and reloading again and again until this happens, the party can get an infinite number of extremely powerful items and a lot of gold from this one Ooh. single dead dragon. I can't wait to use it! It is important to notice that the corpse and any items thrown onto the floor will disappear upon leaving the cave. But an inventory filled with such powerful equipment is more than enough to make the beginning of the game very easy. Killing the remaining dragonflies is not a problem at all. Be careful not to use a bow with the ability Explosive Impact as I did in this playthrough. The area of effect is fairly big and can cause issues for a low level party. This is the main reason why the party is losing health while fighting the dragonflies. After unequipping this particular bow, the rest of Emerald Island is not a challenge at all. Everything in the temple dies with a few hits, even Cell Shock too. Greetings. who attacks the party after we reject his offer to trade ahead for our lives. <laughs> after collecting all the necessary quest items and trading them in, the scavenger hunt is done and the party is on the way to Castle Harmon D. Goblins have taken an interest in your new lands. I'm sure brave adventurers such as yourselves will have no trouble with them. The narrator is certainly right. Clearing out the castle and the rest of Harmondale is absolutely trivial. The enemies in Castle Harmondy itself have to be killed because that quest is part of the main storyline. You can do a lot of interesting things in the open world that lies before you after reaching the mainland, but advancing the story requires a goblin-free home. On the bright side, for perfectionists the castle provides some additional merit. There are barrels with colorful liquids that permanently increase the statistics of a character. Every hardcore fan of the Might and Magic series will remember these colors and their meanings by heart. In contrast to the castle, killing the goblins in the outer areas of Harmondale does not really provide a benefit except for a tiny amount of experience, and not even the chests are really worth the time to open them. 
at least not in a playthrough like this. The so-called White Cliff Caves in the southeast are a different story. The troglodytes that live inside are just as easy to kill as the goblins, but the ooze enemies might be a minor problem, depending on the exact weapons the party is using. This is due to the fact that they cannot be harmed by physical attacks. However, using weapons with added elemental damage will be sufficient to slay them. The main reason to visit the cave is the deck of cards that can be found here. It not only serves as a minor quest item, but also allows you to play Archimage in any tavern, a fun little mini-game that was also released in the year 2000 as a standalone game that includes a multiplayer option. Overall, the equipment gained by the dragon will carry the party through most of the easier areas such as Erathia or the Tidewater Caverns in Tatalia. Robbers, bandits, thieves, skeletons or ghosts, none of these enemies pose a noteworthy threat. But at the same time, the party is far away from being invincible. For example, the enemies in Lord Markham's mansion that are guarding the vase, a crucial quest item for the first thief promotion, are still somewhat dangerous. And so are the trolls in the southeastern and northern area of Tatalia. Though they can be killed, doing so requires a bit more caution than just running up to them and pressing the attack button. Another quest that usually is a bit more difficult and time consuming, namely killing the blue dragon Wanthrax for the paladin promotion quest, can be done quite fast with the same tactic as before if the party picked up a few wands on Emerald Island. And of course the same looting strategy still works. So this is an opportunity to further upgrade the party's equipment with more nice items and artifacts. The first promotion quests also provide a significant amount of experience to start leveling up and the rest of the game can be played very comfortably without any serious problems. But it can still provide a bit of a challenge if you decide to go to some high level areas while the characters are still at a rather low level. Or maybe even at level 1. After all, it is possible to complete the entire game without ever training any of the characters to a higher level. There are also several other methods to approach Might and Magic 7, making this a great game with high replay value and certainly one of my all-time favorite role-playing games. If you liked the video and you want to see more content like this, please consider supporting the channel by executing this algorithm. You will find all the necessary links down below in the description. Thanks for watching, have a nice day!